Hello and welcome. He's famous for his tough challenges to those in power and has built a reputation for himself since the 1960s as someone who's willing to take to the streets for his beliefs. This week on 101, meet writer, filmmaker and left-wing commentator Tariq Ali. He was just a child when Pakistan was created in the partition with India, and both of his parents were already established as staunch social activists. Tariq Ali's maternal grandfather, the distinguished Sir Sikandar Hayat Khan, also had an illustrious career, becoming Prime Minister of Punjab. In the 1960s, Ali became one of Britain's most visible left-wing activists, having originally moved to the UK to study, and ended up friends with celebrities such as John Lennon and the Rolling Stones. Ali's reputation continued to grow over the next four decades with a string of best-selling books that offered some tough jabs at political leaders, particularly U.S. presidents and religious fanatics, against whom he has found himself defending the real, peaceful teachings of Islam. Tariq Ali, thank you very much for some time here. Very good to be with you again. Thank you. There are so many descriptions of you, are, uh, of you and what you are. Historian, novelist, filmmaker, activist... And, you know, it varies depending on whom one asks. But how do you describe yourself? Well, I these days describe myself as a dissenter and a writer. And that sort of suits me. Though obviously, you know, when you travel around the world, some parts of the world they know you better as a novelist and other parts as a historian. So I've given up now defining myself. I let people do it. But you are always known as a firebrand. And, and I know a lot of people tend to mellow with time. To what degree now do you keep that sharp, sharp blade sheath from time to time? Well, I still am. You know, I would regard myself as very radical, very critical of the existing uh, social and political order uh, in the West, um, very critical of the state of the world in many parts uh, that I uh, visit. So I don't think I've changed. I think the world has changed. And you personally, of course, you, you've uh, over the years you've you've become famous. You've succeeded. You've done very well with the writing and so on. And I wonder how that kind of prosperity and success has kind of tempered your your staunchly uh, left wing tendencies. Well, I don't think it has. I remain someone on the left. Uh, I have never been tempted to sell out or to become a renegade or to attack my past. I say what I believe in, I say it very publicly, and either people take it or they don't. It doesn't bother me. I never try to please. Of course, over the years, uh, what seems to have dominated, certainly in, in the, the sort of the new millennium, so to speak, is the... Uh, impact that Islam has had on world politics. And it seems that sort of the, the old world of politics, uh, politicking, left, left-wing, right-wing politicking, has given way to religious politicking. And I wonder to what degree that has also changed how, how you can then... Well, it's, it, it's changed the world, especially in the sense that, you know, for a long, long time, the United States and its allies regarded communism as the biggest enemy. Then with the collapse of that, there was a search for new enemies, and they weren't sure. And then 9-11 happened, and then it became clear that the new enemy was Islam. And that was to be used as an excuse to conquer, occupy, take over countries in the Islamic world, Iraq, Afghanistan. Um, so my position was very clear. I have not been a religious person. I never was. Uh, I'm not still and I never will be. But that doesn't mean that I don't have sympathy with people who live in these countries that are now occupied. And I don't really see this as civilizational. I simply see this as the American empire putting on a new mask and putting a new mask on its enemies and more or less carrying on behaving in the same old way. You've witnessed conflict from an early age. You were born in Lahore in, in British India. And, uh, and just four years later, of course, it became a Pakistani city in the partition. And I wonder how that, that uh, post-conflict and uh, nation-building, post-conflict nation-building time affected your early years, your childhood. Well, when I think back on it, it didn't affect them so much because I was part of that world which became Pakistan. Had I been a Muslim in India or part of a Muslim family in India which had decided to shift or move to Pakistan, the effect would have been much greater. But my family was not marked by that. I grew up in a Lahore, which I absolutely loved. 
and, and still do to a large extent. It was a happy childhood? A very happy childhood. Um, you know, did all the usual things, played cricket, uh, skipped school to play cricket, <laughs> and um, also did things which surprised people at that time. I remember I was still at school. Um, it's 1958 or 59, I can't totally remember, and I read a report in a newspaper, Pakistani newspaper, saying that Jimmy Wilson, an African-American, or a Negro as they called him at that time, has been sentenced to death for stealing a dollar. I couldn't believe it. So I got a whole group of school friends together. This is shocking. So we just marched out of school, about 15 or 20 of us, uh, to the American Consul General, collecting a lot of street urchins on the way to deliver a letter of protest saying this is unacceptable. And the street and the Consul General, the U.S. Consul General in Lahore was a very dour uh, Protestant uh, of German origin called Mr. Spengler. I can still see his sort of, you know, weather-beaten face. And instead of saying, OK, I'll convey, he said, why are you kids, why are you boys out of school? Give me your names. I'm going to complain about you to your principal. and You should be expelled. So that was uh, something I've never forgotten. But we could do it. That was the important thing. No one stopped us. Um, and Pakistan in the 50s and 60s, despite martial law being declared in October 58, was still a very relaxed country to be in compared to what it is now. So my childhood was not too bad. I enjoyed it. You actually came from a very distinguished family, or a very old, crusty, feudal family, as uh, I think you once described it. But both your parents uh, you know, were, were very distinguished uh, 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 citizens. Your father, Mazar Ali Khan, was a journalist. Uh, your mother, Tahira Mazar Ali Khan, was uh, an activist as well. And I guess that, that activism was early, early in your blood as a result then, maybe. Well, both my parents were very radical. The newspaper my father edited, the Pakistan Times, was run by left-wing intellectuals. Uh, it was a very rational, uh, sharp newspaper, very critical of feudalism, landed property, which is a family, we, you know, it's a background we came from ourselves. But my parents were both very radical, whereas the rest of the family was incredibly reactionary, to put it bluntly. So our house was always like that, that on the one side you had poets and artists and trade union leaders and peasant activists and bohemians of every sort. And on the other side, the family were in the military, chiefs of police, civil servants, or basically good for nothings who lived off the fat of the land. And I never had any doubt which side I was on. <laughs> <laughs> because the other gang, the poets and the bohemians, were always much more interesting and much more fun. And one didn't have to be polite there, whereas with the family, there were rituals that had to be followed. Of course, your father uh, sort of broke away from convention in, in this way by actually declaring himself communist and atheist as well. And I wonder what kind of result that, that produced. He was very good like that, my father. He said to me once, you mustn't take up a position just for the sake of it. Even if you're opposed to something, you must know what it is you're opposed to. And he hired a tutor who just taught me Islamic history. The tutor was very radical himself, so often we would get bored and we would start discussing the history of the British Empire and the fight against it in India and who did what. And when he'd hear my parents in the vicinity, he'd suddenly revert to discussing Islamic history and what happened in the Arab world in a very loud voice. But my father insisted that, and he insisted that I be taught the Quran, because he said, you have got to know about these things in this culture, otherwise you get deracinated. So I'm very glad I did all that. It, it served me later when I wrote all my novels, the Islam Quintet. I, I remembered much of this. It came back to me. What, what would you say that uh, the, the biggest lesson was taught to you by your parents? Um, Always my father in particular would say, speak the truth. You know, he never compromised. The newspaper he edited, the chain of newspapers, was taken over by the military in April 1959, and my father never worked again uh, because they refused to accept that we could they could have critical papers in the country. But So he refused himself always to compromise, and 
Not that he ever told me in so many words, don't do it, but I learned that from him, and I have very good memories of him like that. Your maternal grandfather, um, Sir Sikandar Hayat Khan, was also actually a very prominent man as well. Uh, he led the Unionist Muslim uh, League, I think, and uh, became Prime Minister of Punjab in, 19, in 1937? Yeah, he was the prime, uh, elected Prime Minister of the undivided Punjab before partition, and... I never met him because he died very young before I was born. He died when he was on the eve of his 50th year. He had a heart attack and died. Had he lived, people say he would have been one of the leaders of the country. But the other thing people say about him is that had he lived, he would have fought tooth and nail to stop the Punjab being divided because the party he had, while a very conservative formation, united Hindus, Sikhs and Muslims from the top. And that meant that there was also some unity below. People say he was a decent person. I, I wouldn't have agreed with him politically, that much I know. But uh, he wasn't corrupt, he was pretty straightforward, and he attempted to do certain things which benefited the poor, like, for instance, uh, uh, putting restrictions on money lending and high interest rates, for which he was remembered by peasants for a long, long time afterwards. You took that, that path of activism, activism early on. You mentioned in school how you'd gone and petitioned uh, uh, you know, the, the, the embassy, but you also uh, organized demonstrations against the Pakistani uh, military rulers uh, while you were at Punjab University. Yeah. Uh, we, I think the first, you know, when you had a military dictatorship, the first thing they did was say no public demonstrations, more than four people marching together on the streets or even walking together constitutes an offense. That was a law dating back to British imperial times. No political parties, no, no activity is allowed. So it happened like this, that one day we read in the papers that Patrice Lumumba, the first Prime Minister of the Congo, had been murdered, you know. Uh, and he, we were just shocked. How come this guy who's popular, who'd been elected, who had taken on the Belgian colonialists had been shot? And we called a meeting at Government College Lahore, and people came, and I said, we can't sit still, we've got to march. Uh, and protest this. And uh, so we marched out, about five, six hundred of us, not many. And when we marched back to the college, for the first time, slogans against the military dictatorship were shouted. And people chanted, saying, we want democracy, we want freedom, down with the military dictatorship. To our astonishment, nothing happened. They then tried to nobble me by putting restrictions on me. But the following day, you had tens of thousands of students out on the streets protesting against something else. And so a movement built up, and then the army was called out, and they opened fire. And I saw two students being shot dead in front of my eyes. And so these things stay with you. And that movement was, uh, was crushed, and it came back to life in, in the late 60s when it finally toppled the dictatorship. When I wasn't there last, though, I went back to see it in its last stages. But no, that, uh, that we did. And uh, that is something I, I, I feel, uh, you know, very proud of. Uh, how much did it complicate things, the, the fact that your uncle was also chief of Pakistan's military intelligence? Well, it's that he is the one, basically, who went behind my back. Uh, and told my parents to get me out of the country and said, I can't keep him out of prison. The best thing, uh, his life will be wrecked. The best thing is to get him out. They never told me that. Had they done so, I would have refused to leave. Instead, my father said, you're going to study at Oxford. You learn a lot more. You'll have all the books you want to read. And they got me out. It wasn't until years afterwards that they said that he'd arrived at our house when he knew I wouldn't be at home with a file and said, uh, the file is getting bigger and bigger, get him out of the country. So it was off to uh, Exeter College in, in Oxford to study uh, philosophy, politics and economics. How, how did you feel about that transition from going from Pakistan to England? What was, what was going through your mind? Well, uh, I just wondered what it would be like. I, you know, I wasn't prepared for the weather. Uh, or the cold rooms, because we slept in bedrooms in the college which had no heating. So finally, uh, I complained, nothing was done. They gave us more blankets, which didn't work, and uh, 
my mother, panicking by now, wrote to someone who'd worked for us who was now at Bradford. And suddenly one day this worker from Bradford, Punjabi worker, turns up with a huge parcel. And it was a lovely velvet quilt that they'd made for me and brought me. <laughs> so that was one thing. The real culture shock was the food. You know, if you grow up in that part of the world, you're used, even if you have street food, to a certain quality. In England, in 1963, the fall of 1963, had no food worth. You know, it was disgusting. Food we wouldn't have fed to animals in our part of the world, which the English were eating every day. So that posed a real problem. You go into the local restaurant, stupidly called the Taj Mahal, and the food there is awful. So I complained, and the manager said, it's not for you, we cook this food for the English, it's not for people like you. Then he took pity on me and said, there's a Punjabi lady who lives in North Oxford, and she cooks for people like you once a week, so here's her number. So I rang her up, and she said, ah, oh, are you just out here? I feel sorry for you. What do you want to eat? I said, some spinach meat, sag, gosh, dal. She said, come, come, bring a few friends along. And I did, but then I taught myself how to cook and have never stopped ever since. So that was a real culture shock for me. Uh, uh, how bad the food was. Otherwise, it was pleasant. I enjoyed Oxford. I enjoyed the politics. I made many, many close friends. So in 1965, while studying at uh, Oxford University, uh, you were elected president of the union. And, and I guess that uh, there wasn't a lot of South Asians at that time in, at Oxford, were really? Not, not too many. There had been one or two presidents from India, but I was the first Pakistani to be elected president of the Oxford Union. It didn't mean that much at the time, but, you know, it meant a lot to people outside uh, Britain, more, I think, than inside. But the high point of that was not when I was president, but just before I became president, the visit of Malcolm X to the Oxford Union. It was one of the most amazing, astonishing speeches I'd ever heard. He was a powerful orator. And I remember... Afterwards, Malcolm, I took him back to the hotel where he was staying, and we sat and chatted. And he said, Muslim brother. And I said, well, Malcolm, I come from that culture, but I'm not a believer. And he said, oh, no, I know. I've just been to the Arab world. I've met lots of people like you. I said, yeah, we exist. And, you know, we're... and we laughed and talked, and we had an amazing conversation. And at the end of it... Uh, I stood up and said, I better go. Bye, Malcolm. Hope to meet you soon. I hope we meet up again. And he said, I don't think we will. I said, why? I mean, we sat down again. And he said, I think they're going to kill me very soon. I said, who is going to kill you? He said, either the Nation of Islam or the FBI or both. He knew it. His days were numbered. And I didn't believe him. You know, I said, God, this is talk. People talk like that. It can't be the case. And this was December. That next year, in February 65, I opened The Guardian, and there it was on the front page, Malcolm X assassinated. So occasionally you met people like that at the union, which made it worthwhile, really. Is there any truth in the, uh, the story that the Rolling Stones wrote that 1968 hit uh, Street Fighting Man about you and Power to the People, also written by John Lennon, came after an interview he did uh, with you. Yeah, that's true. Uh, we'd interviewed John Lennon for our newspaper at the time and a long, long interview. And the next morning he rang me up. I'd met him before, too. And then we did the interview. And he said, I was so inspired by our interview that I've written a song for the movement. So I said, what's the song called, John? And he said, power to the people. Uh, should I sing it to you? So I said, please do. So he sang it to me on the phone and said, well, I said, it's great. You know, it'll be sung on the marches, and it was. And then um, I think several months later, or he rang and said, come, I want to, I'm working on a new album, and I want you to hear it. And I went over, and at that time, he'd just written Imagine. This was the Imagine album. And sitting around his kitchen table, he, I said, well, how does Imagine go? And he told me, and he said, well, I said, you have my approval. <laughs> it's good. Uh, Mick Jagger's thing was different. He wrote this song, you know, and sent it to me. <clears throat> 
and said, I've just written this song for you. And uh, they're not playing it on the BBC, so could you please publish the words in your newspaper? <laughs> so we did. And of course, it, everyone was playing it for months and years afterwards. What struck you as the, as the sort of real defining moment in your life then? I think, without any doubt, when the two great European philosophers, Bertrand Russell and Jean-Paul Sartre in France, fed up with what was going on in Vietnam, decided to set up an international war crimes tribunal, an independent one, to try the United States for war crimes, I was one of the people they selected to go to North Vietnam and report on what I had seen and interview people and victims. So I went to North Vietnam at the height of the war in December 1966, stayed there till February 1967, saw what was going on in that country, visited places under heavy bombardment. We couldn't travel during the day because the bombing was so heavy. So we had to travel at night. Uh, in you know wearing camouflage and camouflage command cars and the next morning one would wake up and go and visit the hospitals where the wounded had been taken and the children and that left a mark on me forever it was a horrific experience and the fact that the Vietnamese managed to survive and actually win that war was quite astonishing given the firepower against them and I've, I've never forgotten that. So when I read casual reports of drone attacks in Pakistan or bombings on Libya or Iraq or Afghanistan, I do recall that. And I know what it means for the people below. Who, who have you considered your mentors in life then? I don't think I've had mentors as such. As someone, you know, I've grown up reading books and many, many uh, books uh, of all sorts, uh, fiction and non-fiction and history, and I've learned a great deal from them. I mean, my generation in the 60s used to read a lot of Marx, a lot of Lenin, a lot of Che Guevara, and I've never actually regretted that because one learned a great deal from them, even knowing they didn't get everything right or they made mistakes, not to mention Trotsky, who's a very, very great writer and thinker. So one learned a lot from them and... Also then from Russell, from Jean-Paul Sartre, from the people who were still alive when we were young. And these have left their impact. They're all part of my own intellectual formation. In terms of uh, the way the years have, have shaped society across the world, that sort of the, the, the real left wing, I guess, seems to have really given way to capitalism and, and consumerism and so on. How do you regard the way things have changed and really moved away from what the values that you've always espoused? Well, I regard it as something that happens in history. It's happened before, uh, but history is not consistent like that. It always has originality and it always surprises one. I mean, like who would have predicted that Tunisia would have become the fulcrum of an Arab revolt which spread to all over the Arab world. I mean, the last time we saw that in a big way was in Europe in the uh, 19th century uh, or the early 20th century. So history has a way of going up and down. So I, the fact that, you know, one has been living over the last 30 years in a period of defeat... Um, it's not pleasant, but one accepts it. The worst thing, I think, is to refuse to recognize that it has happened and carry on as if nothing's happened. That's foolish, and it leads to fantasies in politics and other fields. It's happened, but I think it could change again. You've made so many films, you've written an incredible number of books, and you're, you're active in the media, writing and, and appearing on TV. But when it comes to your legacy, how would you like to be remembered? I guess I would like to be remembered as a dissenter, as someone who always said what needed to be said in bad times to those in power or those who had become the acolytes and sycophants of power, including many people in the media, many writers, many journalists. 
That's that's all I want to be remembered by. Nothing more. Tarek Ali, it was wonderful talking with you. Thank you very Thank much. You,